So, I think if we've ever really had a time to seek out God, I think it would be right now in what we're living through. I believe if all Christians would just consider in some form of way recognizing and celebrating Passover this year, if the church would just come back to God's plan, I think we could actually maybe you know, really see this plague get lifted from us. Passover is the tradition of the Lamb's blood of protection from death and pestilence. It's a worship and celebration to God commanded by Him to be remembered. It's like an actual worship and act of faith to God and to Jesus. And unlike popular belief in Christianity, it's actually New Testament. It's actually instructed in the New Testament. And it's as much a celebration of Easter or as Christmas in the Nativity. In 1 Corinthians 5, we find Paul clearly instructs Christians to keep the Feast of Passover. It says, For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival. Do you also know that the King James Bible, which was the standard Bible for most of time, is the only Bible that actually has the word Easter in it? And it was purposely put there to persuade the church away from anything Jewish. And it's the reason we all celebrate Easter now in its weird, strange little pagan rituals that go along with it. that have nothing to do with Jesus is crucifixion or resurrection at all. Now to get into Passover, I'll just explain a little of how the dinner goes actually just explain how the whole dinner goes and you'll see all the meaning and symbols of Jesus in it. The actual first act of Passover, Seder meal, would be first thing you do is you light a candle. The candle lighting, which is followed by a prayer, is done by the woman of the house. This is symbolic of the candle, symbolic of the light of the world, bringing in the light. And the woman doing it, you can see, is clearly symbolic of Mary bringing the light of the world, Jesus, to us. If you look in the Bible, you see from Genesis to Revelation, the death of the Lamb was planned from the foundation of the world. Revelations 13, 8, the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. When Jesus took part of Passover, he would, could glance down and at first glance he would just see his entire life played out before him because everything on that plate is symbolic of everything he he's going to do and did when you understand and appreciate the passover service as observed in the days of jesus and the first church the more real your covenant becomes the more the love the sacrifice of jesus becomes the last supper is a fulfillment of over four thousand years as it's repeated and prayed every year in the Passover service since the days of Israel wandering through the wilderness this has been done as you've seen from the story of Moses all the way to now God's instructed to remember it once a year every year it's full of praise it's full of prayers it's full of everything Jesus did it's really an awesome dinner if you can grasp your mind around it and actually see it and and take out some of the thoughts of Easter and thoughts of oh that's just Jewish because it's actually like I said in the New Testament it's completely part of God's plan and it's really cool so you know many Christians don't even fully comprehend the Passover in the context context of its anointing work of God that's there and you can fully appreciate the redemption of Jesus the Messiah when you understand the Feast of Passover, all the Feasts of Israel are just a foreshadow of 
what Jesus would do and what Jesus is going to do. The Gospel John uses the Passover as a backdrop for his retelling of the atonement that we have received through Jesus. So the actual Seder plate that you have in front of you, different little foods on it, as I said, each one means something, it actually has all elements of Jesus' life. It's got a suffering, it's got a sacrifice, it's got a resurrection. It tells, you know, the story of the Jews leaving through the Exodus into the Promised Land and being delivered. It's also our deliverance, our Promised Land promise, all through what Jesus did. The Seder plate itself has always pointed to him. So first we'll start with the bitter herbs. These are, you put some vegetables on your plate. Probably like parsley is usually used. That's what we use. It's, it's a green vegetable. This represents the hyssop branch, which is used to apply the blood on the doorpost. In Exodus 12.22 it says, Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on on top of both sides of the door frame God will see the blood on top and side of the door frame and he will pass over the doorway he will not permit the destroyer to enter your house or strike you down interestingly they say that the way the blood was painted up there it actually forms a cross everything is symbolic we see again the hyssop branch in Yeshua John 19 28 as he neared death Jesus said I thirst and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar he said it is finished and bowed his head and gave up his spirit now the roasted lamb bone or shank bone most people nowadays usually just use like a chicken some form of meat with a bone in it. The roasted lamb bone or shank bone is a reminder of the temple sacrifice and the first Passover lamb. The shank bone in Hebrew is called zoroa. Zoroa literally means an arm. It's reminiscent of the outstretched arm of God which he took to deliver his people. Also, it's an image of Yeshua's outstretched arms on the cross, completing the sacrifice of death to pass over all in him. We move to the bread of life. Probably one of the only things most people know about Passover. So you have your, your flat bread that they eat, the uh, unleavened bread, <clears throat> which we find here in the New Testament as well when we do communion. He broke it and said, take it eat this this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me in the same manner he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me now this is kind of a cool point because Jesus is the bread of life if you were to do a Hebrew word study on the word Bethlehem it's not only the birthplace of Jesus, but the word Bet Elohim in Hebrew. Elohim means bread, and Bet means house. It's the house of bread. John 6, 3, 5, I am the bread of life. There's the matzah bread, which you find in Exodus 29, 7, Deuteronomy 16, 3. It's the unleavened bread. Paul talks about the unleavened bread. It has no yeast in it not enough time to rise they, they had to hurry up and gather everything they had and be ready to flee out of Egypt into the wilderness so they left you know little things like yeast and stuff behind and just brought the main elements of what they needed for the bread there's the blur the bread of affliction it's three slices of bread tradition includes you place these three slices of bread these matzo breads into a cloth or a pouch and it goes into each section. You, you cover each one of them and put them in one whole wrapped thing. The, ma the matzah bread represents the bread of affliction. 
we also see the parallel here between the three pieces of matzah. You see the manifestation of the God, Son, and Holy Spirit, some say. It also represents other things in Judaism like Isaac, Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, stuff like that. But here's the cool part. The larger piece of the bread, you break it and it's you wrap that one piece in its own cloth and you take it and you go hide it and usually you get kids and you ain't got no kids you get somebody else but after you finish your whole Seder meal the Passover meal someone goes and gets that piece of bread kind of like Easter egg cut and they bring it back and when they bring it back you get to break it up and share it with them and you give them a prize if it's a kid so that in its own is Jesus in the burial cloth being put away into a tomb only to be resurrected later on and with that you get a prize the prize of everlasting life there's also other aspects of the plate which are a mixture of clay apple nuts cinnamon wine it's, it's actually pretty good these represent the bricks and the mortars that the Israelites were forced to make under Pharaoh's taskmasters, which you find in Exodus 1.19. Matthew 26.22, you find where Jesus makes reference to this during the Last Supper. He says, well, Matthew says, And as they ate, he said to them, Amen, I say to you, that the one of you will betray me whoever dips his hand in this dish will betray me that's during Passover you take this apple stuff and you take some of the matzo bread and you you put it on the bread you, you, you bread and you dip it into the, the apple mixture which is called sop and in the New Testament it says whichever one of you dips into the sop with me is the one who will betray me there's also salt water which symbolizes the tears shed by the Israelites and it's also Israel's baptism into the Red Sea. There's a second bitter herb. It's the bitterness of slavery and bondage. And then afterwards, when you get through with all of that, and you eat your meal and everything else, you open up the front door, and you set out a plate, and you set out a glass. This is for the prophet Elijah, who the Jewish people are still expecting Elijah to return, you know, bringing in, calling in the new, for their Messiah to come, which we already know, Messiah's came through Yeshua, and he was already declared by John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah. So it's basically us opening up the door to the Holy Spirit to come into our house. And then when it finishes the meal, it ends by pretty much everybody concludes by singing praises, singing songs to God. Most of these songs you can find in the book of Psalms. Now here on this part, I'm going to teach you something a little bit cooler about Passover. You can find all of God's promises in the Passover. Passover begins at sunset or sundown. The first symbolism of Passover and communion is all the way back in the book of Genesis when Melchizedek brings bread and wine to Abraham. This is actually symbols of the New Testament Passover. This is also the first time God's title, God of Most High, or God's title of the Most High is used. It is used four times in this section on the eve of Passover, and I'll get to that shortly. Understanding how and where this divine title is used will help us realize how much of a blessing Passover is to us. So, Abraham has brought bread and wine by Melchizedek. And if you look into Genesis 15, you see it's a mention of the stars with Abraham's promise. Obviously, it's dark. This foreshadow of Passover takes place in that period between dim light and dark time. This is the time that we actually observe the real Passover Seder, just as the sun goes down. 
this is where the opening of Genesis 15 is time wise and I'll show you back in Genesis 12 God implied that Abraham's family would be great after Abraham asked for clarification God gave him a promise using the illustration of the stars in order for Abraham to see the stars it would have to be evening so this time in the Bible is called Ben Ha Abriyam which is a Hebrew word which takes place in the time shortly after afternoon until sunset Passover is always celebrated on the 14th of Nisan Nisan is just the name of in Hebrew for the month the 13th day would have ended and the 14th day Passover would begin this is undoubtedly when you read that Melchizedek brought forth the bread and wine Abraham's vision was at dark now if you jump into Exodus 12 5 you see your Passover lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening using the word Ben Ha Abriyam this is one of the places where the word evening is from in the term Hebrew Ben Abriyam in English twilight or dusk so now I'll do a understanding of communion communion is more than just partaking in the bread and the body of Jesus you know you do that and get his blessings it's actually a contract and we first seen this con con kind of communion with Abraham in Genesis if you would study any type of history Middle Eastern history thousands of years before Christ back then ancient people who actually wanted to sign terms with one another such as sharing land for grazing or the end feuds or, or whatever reason this would be done by them having a meeting and negotiation the agreements would be made and then they would break bread and bring out their finest wine also there would usually be some form of sacrifice that would spill blood all of this to seal the deal eventually over time because they didn't always have sacrificial animals some believe that this is pretty much where ancient people got cut in their hands which would be like blood brothers that we know of so my point to all this and it's a pretty good point is when you take away all the theological magic to the Holy Communion such as God's blood God's body which I'm not downplaying it but what you see is the disciples actually took part and would have been what would have been a contract this is something they would have well understood back then in their time so basically the Last Supper was them signing a contract with Jesus if we did it nowadays I would hand you pen and paper you would sign your names on it but as I said this was something well understood in ancient cultures so when you take communion you are agreeing to all the terms and promises of a contract so my point in all of this is when you realize that Jesus is with you and I'll use a little story we know on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection of Jesus we had two disciples walking and they encountered and walked with a traveler that they met after they walked for a while with them they didn't know who he was still didn't know who he was we know in the story it was Jesus they asked him if he'd like to come stay with them so he agrees then you get into the story when they all go back to the house it says when he was at the table with them he took bread gave thanks broke it and began to give it to them then their eyes were opened and they recognized him so here we see it was from this communion beginning from the previous Passover 
that they would only realize it was Jesus who was among them the whole time. If you were to take part of Passover observance, you would be in doing so not only honoring God, but openly, openly acknowledging all of the promises over you and your home. His will and the ability to protect you from sickness and plague. But it's also his healing power, the healing power of Yeshua and his protective blood that we see in the Passover. So I think if Christians, if you would decide to take part of some form of observance of Passover this year, and you don't have to have all the aspects of the plate, you know, just the main ones, that you would not only be observing God and Jesus, but you would be acknowledging all his promises over your home, all his protectiveness. It's the healing power of Yeshua's blood that protects from the plague and the sickness and the death that comes in the Passover story. And as I said, this time, right now that we're living in, something is passing over us. I believe this plague could be lifted through a meal that is the awareness of our God, the Deliverer, and the Savior, who is Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the Lamb who brings life and healing among all who seek it. So I hope some of you will join with me and my family in celebrating Passover this year and we can give all the honor to God and watch God break this. Yeshua eagerly awaits his church to return to the observance of his Passover. The New Testament makes this clear. And when it was time, Yeshua came and reclined and the twelve apostles with him. And he said to them, I have greatly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. 